for joining us uh, this afternoon, or I should say this evening, or even this morning, depending on where you're joining us from. You know, it's funny, uh, last year we did one of these meet cute events in Minneapolis, and, and we, we tend to do one every single year somewhere in the Midwest. So last year was Minneapolis, the year before that was Milwaukee. And, and this year, because of COVID-19, unfortunately, we had to do it virtually. Well, I don't know if, if doing things virtually um, or our subject matter, QT for Embedded Technologies, but, but whatever it was, something touched a nerve and, and uh, this thing really kind of took off in terms of popularity. And so we're excited to have all of you here today. I think it's going to be a very profitable time. I think you're, you're going to learn a lot. Um, we've got some, uh, some wonderful speakers lined up for you. Um, joining me today is San Tu Honen, uh, and uh, he's one of our product managers. Uh, Maureen Sunbin is, or actually Mo, as she's known, uh, or known by around here. Uh, Mo is actually my right hand. Uh, she's the technical counterpart to, uh, to my sales. And then joining us from the Bobcat uh, company is Zach, is Zach Dahl. So, um, so we're very excited to have all three of, of those people joining us. Um, we do have, we, we do have uh, a lot of material that, that we're going to try to go through in a very short amount of time, uh, but we do want to keep this interactive. So, um, so what we'd like you to do would be to take advantage of the Q&A uh, button down below and uh, any question that you have, something that's said, uh, you know, whatever questions you have, make sure that, that you type them up. Um, and, and we've allowed time after each speaker and then even at the end um, to address as many questions as we can. Uh, the reason we'd like to have you type them up is because just in case we can't get to every single question, we, can, we will follow up and make sure that, uh, that, that we get you an answer. So, so I, I, in talking to the panelists, we were kind of, uh, you know, just kind of wondering why this particular topic was of such importance to so many people. And, and if you think about it, 10 years ago, you didn't have a smart thermostat that automatically learns your preferences and adjusts itself automatically. You didn't have a, a, a doorbell that would allow you to see who's at the door just by looking at your smartphone. Um, 20 years ago, uh, if you bought a new car, the first thing you would do would be to take the radio out of it and put in a, a good stereo system. And now I defy you to show me a car commercial on television that, that the, the center council is, is definitely one of the shots that they show in every single car commercial that you see today because things have changed that dramatically in the last 20 years. Um, even just a year ago, I remember um, telling my wife that I'm, I'm currently working with a client who's producing a whirlpool tub that will allow you to draw the water, again, using your smartphone, so you could be driving home from work, you draw the water, it keeps the water at a particular temperature that you like so that when you get home, boom, right straight into the bath, no waiting. And, and she was super excited about that. So, so, I mean, this is, this is just part of the reason why I love my job so much is because I get to see the future in advance. And, and so that's one of the things that, I, that we wanna really show you today is what the future potentially looks like, what are some of the things that, uh, that you can do developing using QT, and, and then we have a real life example uh, with Bobcat uh, that, that we'll show you as well. So with that, I'm going to, uh, to turn things over uh, to one of our senior product managers. Uh, his name is Santu Ahonen, and he obviously works here as the, uh, at the QT company. He's been here uh, uh, for quite some time. He has over 20 years of experience in product management with various high-tech companies um, covering a wide range of products. And uh, he's, he's a resource that we're extremely excited about. So Santu, take things away. Hello, hello. Uh, hope you can hear me. I did remember to unmute myself, so I'm not talking to an empty mic as, as usual. So um, I, 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 we booked about 40 minutes for this first part. 
uh, where I would, I'm planning to present about 30 minutes and then we have uh, 10 minutes for your question and answers and then we'll move over and as Tim said at the end, you know, we can cover the, the other stuff uh, and, and more questions and answers uh, at the end. So uh, today I'll be, I'll be talking about very shortly about the Qt company, just a reminder if there are newcomers who don't know us, so where are we, where did we come from? Um, then talk about the, the design and developer workflow and how designers and developers work together. Uh, that's an area where we, when we have been studying how our customers are working and how they're using our tools and then out of that analyzing where is their uh, time wasted and effort wasted. Uh, we've come up with a, with a tooling uh, end to end that helps in, in that area so that makes things smoother and helps you with your time to market needs. Um, then I'll very quickly touch the, um, the, the embedded targets and you with the Qt 5.15, um, go with the release roadmap uh, overview and then uh, very quickly talk about the Qt 6 graphic architecture. So it's going to be very packed uh, and condensed information. So you may have to go back to the, your old presentation and look at it in slow motion, but let's see. So, Qt company at a glance, uh, Qt as a technology is actually quite old. It started 1995 from it, so it's from last century. Um, with the WonderTalk came um, then, and then the Qt 5 version is now eight years old, uh, released in 2012. Uh, and then towards the end of this year, we are going to be releasing Qt 6. And a uh, remarkable thing with the Qt 5 is that it's a binary compliance, so it's more than eight years of binary compliance. So very few systems, uh, technologies, platforms out there can actually claim uh, such a long binary compliance. We have been growing tremendously, and we have about 340 employees around the world. Uh, our engineering offices are in Oulu in Northern Finland, in Oslo in Norway, and in Berlin in Germany. Uh, and then all the other offices are sales offices around the world where we have uh, technical people helping sales and salespeople and uh, the headquarters in, is, is in Finland. Um, we do work in about 70 industries um, and uh, anytime we release a, a, a version of Qt, we get roughly one and a half million uh, developers downloading it and uh, using it. So that's roughly where we are uh, in the market. Now, um, as I said, we'll be looking into the, our customers, the, the development workflow, and, and not really matter if you use Waterfall or, or Lean or something in between in terms of engineering practices. There usually is uh, three main phases in that. So uh, uh, there is the, the design part of designing the application and the UI of your solution. Then there is the, the actual development part, and sometimes these go back and forth quite a lot. And then there's a the deployment uh, part, the, the deploy to, to deploy the first prototypes all the way deploy to, to make it uh, part of the manufacturing and make millions of devices or whatever you're doing. Now, uh, and these phases and stages you'll find in, in pretty much any engineering process. Now, uh, when we looked at that um, uh, with the Qt design tools and with the Qt uh, approach, um, the designer is using their favorite um, design tools, that be that Photoshop or Sketch. And for example, in here, an example draws the uh, dials for the temperature and the buttons and that kind of stuff. And then uh, the designer can then import those into the Qt tools and add then the application logic, uh, the, the wireframes and the interaction models and animations and shadows and all of that, which is part of the application, but not part of the, the, the design tools, but our, they are part of the Qt Design Studio. Then what the design is saving uh, and what is the output of that work is, the, is the, the actual UI code that can then be taken over by the developer in the developer tools. And if they are using Git or, or something, a repository to share these tools, they can also see changes and updates back and forth of which each party is doing. And the developer is then adding the, the hardware integration and the application logic and whatever is needed for the solution between. As our design tools are actually inherited and underneath based on our developer tools, um, the, the deployment mechanism is part of the design tools. So that helps that both parties can have a look at the application on the real embedded device with the real display, with the real contrast, with the real bio brightness, with the right aspect ratio, all of that. 
and that really matters for designers uh, together. And the, and the last, uh, they can do the maintenance of the solution. So what's based on, on structured languages and uh, architecture and, uh, and like, uh, like I said, uh, with Qt5, with over five years of binary compliance, they can trust on the maintenance and do the cross-platform implementation too. So this is in essence the, the new thing what we've been doing in the past couple of years on improving the, the workflow and the collaboration between designers and developers, really impo impo improving the time to market for our customers. Let me take a slightly different angle into the, uh, into the development. Look into the cross product line development and a cross platform functionality, which both designers and developers can utilize and, and, and uh, and uh, benefit. So uh, the, there can be a low end product line. In this case, an example is a Cortex M4 device uh, with very cheap bill of material. Uh, the UI may not be uh, lightning fast, um, uh, but it has all the basic elements, uh, basic uh, animations on it. Then there could be a mid range of products. These are examples of washing machines, but they could be space rockets or cars or, or or, or any other products. There's a mid-range of products that can be already uh, based on a, an MPU uh, application process. So running a Linux uh, or a real-time operating system can have, might have much higher resolution, uh, better graphics. And then there is a high end of products that can have uh, really big displays, uh, 3D graphics, uh, some augmented reality uh, and other features like that uh, built into it. And then, um, uh, they can also do the companion apps because um, it's a cross-platform framework. And now comes the point though. So all of these different applications and solutions can be based on the same physical uh, design, same physical application logic because it's a cross-platform framework. So when implemented right, it, they are not done by different teams or different, they are not different applications. They are a variant of the same application which really helps in managing the cost of the engineering uh, and time to market of building this whole product line. So I'll jump back to the design and developer workflow and the, and the pitfalls with that. So if you look at the typical design and developer workflow when not using the Q tools is that we still, we have the visual designers and interaction designers and developers uh, in the flow and they are all using their own tools uh, uh, and technologies. And none of these um, tools, uh, they are like working on an isolated islands where they, there are no ferries between those islands or they are very, very clumsy. So uh, at worst, it happens so that an interaction designer dreams of an animation from screen to another, uh, draws those pictures, adds long text, uh, textual descriptions of the issues, and then saves that as a PDF and sends that to a developer, who then tries to mimic that on the, on the developer side and trying to do that. So that's where uh, what we call a lot of waste happens, where the, um, the transitions between di these different phases and then the assets that are created are not directly usable between these uh, different phases. And, and that's why the design studio and the developer tooling allows that, that when, you, when the designers are using the Qt design studio, the output they're doing is actually the real UI of the solution. And then the developer can take that and do the background uh, application logic and hardware integration into that. And both parties, as I said, can deploy and see it on the real life device. So that makes a big difference um, for the designers to work on. So now I'll be sw swapping slightly to a different topic, uh, talking about the portability and the, the embedded uh, section on, on how do we port on different embedded systems. So, so uh, Qt is a cross-platform framework. Um, it's a big part of our pro uh, process and, uh, and practice and it's been our, in our genes from day one. So all the way from 1995, we've been, um, our vision has been that it's a code once deploy everywhere. So the same physical code can be compiled to a number of different targets. Um, and that has uh, really helped us uh, over the years um, to, to, uh, to optimize that and to excel on that area. 
Uh, we do provide ready-made images for a number of different um, uh, environments like ready-made designer tooling uh, integration. We do have a uh, pre-built sample images for uh, a good number of different microcontrollers, MCUs. Um, pretty much any MPU application processor device that can run a semi-decent POSIX uh, or Linux can actually run also uh, Qt. We do offer what we call a boot to Qt. It's a ready-made environment for uh, embedded Linux that gets you started on day one. Um, you can create that on your own or you can get that done as a service from us. Or we do support a number of different real-time operating systems. And, and if you cannot find the flavor you need, um, we can do it as a service. So one of our partners can do that as a service for you. So a few more words on the microcontroller. So the microcontroller um, is slightly different from the rest of the Qt, uh, as the, the QML side is the, is the part, and the UI side is the part that is running uh, um, on microcontroller, and, and it's compliant with the rest of the Qt. So if you write an application with a QML for an MCU, uh, you can take the same UI code and run that on anywhere else where Qt is running with uh, almost no or, or no modifications. Um, we do offer um, a hardware directly bare metal uh, adaptation on MCUs, and that's why with the, the rest of the C++ side of the Qt is not available on the, on the MCUs. But then you, would do, you need to do that on the, on the native C++ side, or, or you can use a free art or some other operating system. So we do have these ready-made images for a good number of different vendors on the MCU side. Then if you look at the, the MPU side and the application processor and the Linux world, um, I mentioned the boot to good stack. So um, that's a, that's a ready-made uh, getting started stack for projects to be able to take an off the shelf hardware, uh, plug it in the computer, flash it. And in five minutes, you get your fir first application, hello world running in there in the, in that device. So it's really, uh, everything ready-made from hardware drivers to operating system to the Qt stack and gets you going uh, from day one. So it's super good for this kind of a quick prototyping and getting the project started. But what often happens is that during the life cycle of the project, you want to edit that, you may realize that, okay, it's running a web server. I don't need a web server, so let me get rid of that. Or if you don't know how to play with the Octo uh, and embedded Linux, uh, we'll customize it for you as a service but the um, that's where we are uh, we, we and, and what the, for the boot good and the boot good stacks you can find um, uh, through the installer or there's a lot of them available under the account of Qt.io downloads so um, that's where you can find them uh, and then last bit on this this portability so so um, I think there is only a couple of questions that we need to we need to know that can can a Qt run so so and I, I look at them that usually the rule of thumb is that if it can run a Linux you know it can run a Qt so that's that's usually um, the really crude uh, rule of thumb um, but uh, Qt needs uh, underneath a, a, a POSIX or or some other the full Qt needs a, a POSIX or some other um, uh, operating system Windows or Mac or Android or something like that. Um, uh, layer and then um, if you need a UI, we do have a lot of customers who are using doing headless devices. So, um, but they don't need a windowing system. But if you need a UI and you need some kind of a windowing system, so OpenGL, Vulkan Metal, Direct 3D, or something else, where we can uh, uh, tap into to to integrate with the with the UI. And when I look at the most issues with the hardware porting are usually on the on the wireless peripherals. So they are in the Bluetooth, wireless LAN, cellular uh, layers, and they are usually on the on the on the hardware drivers, not on the Qt side. But that's where um, if you want to focus on your your solution and what really being, brings you value, which is the the UI, um, that's where we we do have a lot of good partners that can help there or we can, we can take it up and, and fix those things for you. So that's about it. So then looking into the, into the new features on, on the 5.15 and Qt Creator. So Qt, Qt Creator 4.12 came out with the Qt 5.15 uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, new things in there are that there is the, the marketplace integration. 
Um, we've improved um, the Clang tools, uh, also preparing for the next releases. Um, there is a language error protocols, uh, fully integrated Qt4 MCU support, which is of course for the MCU customers important. Um, there's a uh, improved project and kit setup um, that also helps, for example, with the Android experience on getting started. So um, the tooling will detect uh, the environments uh, much better and easier. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, improvements on this getting started side. Um, we've improved the CMake support. CMake is the direction which we are we are taking more and more into, but it's not the only only environment that we are using. But CMake is being improved in, in in Creator, and then of course there is a support for the 515 LTS as a as a release. Then on the tooling side, uh, Design Studio 1.5, which is also out uh, last week, um, there are a couple of cool new things in there. So um, there are more bridges for importing designs and content from uh, content creation tools. Um, there is a visual UI, uh, code editors, um, there is an advanced 3D editor, there is, a, as part of Qt 5.15, there is a, now a first time a combined 2D, 3D scene graph, which is now supported on both design tools and creators. Um, there's a visual flow editors and a, and a number of other features coming up with the 1.5. And I think the most seeked out uh, feature is the ability to take the workspaces on multiple display, multiple displays. So uh, even though you are designing small devices with small screens, um, you need quite a lot of display real estate on the design and development phase. So um, now the, the design studio also supports uh, this kind of a multi-display uh, setup. That's been a um, lot seeked out. And the last bit on the on the design studio is the design annotation. So um, there is a nice way for designers to add annotations and communicate with the developers on on what's the intent of certain modules on the UI and what do they want to do. Uh, and this is actually are embedded into the QML code, so the, the the developer can see them as comments in the QML code where the designer has this uh, annotation UI. So that ends the section for uh, for the for the new features on 5.15 and the, the embedded part. So I'm going to talk about the, the roadmap a little bit. Um, for the roadmap, um, we have uh, two kinds of releases. So so we have uh, time box releases where the schedule is the key, and those are the the main Qt framework uh, feature releases. So Qt 5.14, 5.15, 6.0, 1, and so on. So they are uh, the feature releases uh, for the framework itself, and they come twice a year. So that works like a steam hammer. So it's a certain date, and it has a certain dates and deadlines that there's a feature freeze, uh, feature complete, alphabet, and so on. And really, because it's time boxed, it means that um, the schedule is the king, the content will move. So if people are asking me that what are going to be the features of 6.19, I need to say, I don't know yet, but it will come out on, on November. So, so that's that's how it how it works for the time boxing. We also have feature driven and fixed driven releases. So the patch releases uh, for the framework. So Qt 15.1, 15.2, 66.0.1, 6.0.2, and so on. They are patch releases. They don't have features. They may have changes or updates uh, due to the operating systems evolving, like underlying operating systems getting new releases or, or old releases getting deprecated. So, so that kind of stuff is in there, but they are really for bug fixes in, the, in releases and they are driven by features and the bug fixes. So if we find a, a critical security bug, we'll release it next day. If we find uh, that there are important bugs for enough, of, uh, for enough many people benefit for fixing those, that's the kind of generic rule of just put it together, ship it out. And then, of course, the creator and the design studio are also as tools living in this feature and fixture releases. And how we then combine this is that when we are about to release, uh, let's say we just released the Qt 5.15, uh, we just look at that, what is you know, the latest reliable good version of the creator, and we'll put that in there. So that happened to be 5.4 to 12 and that, yeah, that way. So, and I want to explain this and spend time on explaining this because if you look at our blog post, you will see that every week we announce that we release something. So, so this helps you understand you know, where do those things land. Now, 
the release roadmaps and the uh, time box releases for the framework itself. Uh, we are doing two kinds of releases for our commercial customers. So there are the, the LTS releases that are supported for three years. And then there are uh, the non-LTS releases, so the, the normal releases, which are supported for 12 months from the date of the release. So if you look at the current uh, view of the world, the 5.9 uh, is out of support. It was released May 20, uh, 2017, so that expired uh, last May. Uh, 5.12 LTS is now in the middle of its life cycle, so it was released in December 2014, 2018, and it's going to be supported until December 2018. If you really need support for that, we do sell extended support for uh, customers, but that's uh, something you want to talk with them. Um, 5.13 is out of support already. Uh, 5.14 uh, will expire this December, and now just last week uh, or two weeks ago we released the good 515 uh, lts and that will be supported all the way until may uh, 2023 um, the next big thing is the q6 uh, coming up uh, now uh, november december this year um, and then 6.1 may next year and then uh, 6.2 the first lts version of the 6 series uh, at the end of next year so that's roughly 17 months uh, away from today. And we do expect that majority of the customers are, are typically gravitating to the LTS releases because they have the longer support life, life cycle. So um, that's where most people are gravitating into. So uh, the, the biggest take up on Q6 will happen with the 6.2 LTS. Now, what's the difference between five and six? As I said earlier, I mentioned it a couple of times. So the binary compliance promise goes with the with the with the main major releases. So five is binary compliant with earlier versions of the five, and we 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 vigorously want to keep that uh, promise. But it also is very hard. Like maintaining binary compliance for eight years means that there is quite a lot of old stuff in there, and sometimes it's time to do some house cleaning. So there is a fair amount of house cleaning happening. Um, but the biggest new feature is the new graphics architecture uh, from uh, 515 to, or from 5 series to Q6. And this new graphics architecture is now optional already in 515. So if you're really interested in, in looking into it, you can go and download the 515 and, and, and play with that new graphics architecture uh, to get a hunch or the feeling of the, of the Q6. And why we did the, the new graphic architecture is that eight years ago, uh, 3D was really a dream, uh, in the, especially on the embedded side. Uh, it didn't really uh, exist in, in any practical manner uh, at that point. Um, and at that point, the only way to do 3D uh, in the industry was using OpenGL. There was no other way of, of doing 3D. So, so it ended up with the architecture that in Qt5, the, the, the handling of the 2D and 3D are done by two different scene graphs, which is uh, wasting uh, memory or resources or uh, efficiency in the applications. Today, um, more and more our customers want to combine uh, two, uh, 3D elements or 3D UI elements into their 2D uh, applications. And uh, we've taken that as a really, really serious direction. So, so that's why there is now one unified combined 2D, 3D scene graph uh, engine in the Qt6. And it will be able to natively integrate to not only to OpenGL, but also to uh, Vulkan, to Apple Metal, and to Microsoft Direct 3D as a backend. And this gives us an architecture that adds us, uh, allows us to add even more uh, in the future as a, as a porting layer for different um, engines by different operating systems and hardware. So that's, that's the big thing. So if we compare the Q5 and uh, uh, Q6, so the 5 to 12 has the, the 3D uh, studio and 3D runtime as a separate element and, and 2D scene graph uh, as, a, as a separate element, but they both are tied into the OpenGL. In 5.15, uh, we have now the, uh, as an optional, the, the first the combined 2D, 3D scene graph uh, using OpenGL and on six we will have that as the framework for going forward for when you need to draw something on the display uh, and it's going to be able to use natively the OpenGL, Vulkan, Metal and uh, Direct 3D. That's the end of it and I timed this 30 minutes and it's now 29 minutes and 20 seconds so that was if nothing else good timekeeping so time for some Q&A.
Uh, there's the first okay. question. So, go ahead. Yeah, Maori. Uh, yeah, I was just going to read them for you. So the first one is, what are the minimal RAM and flash um, requirements for QT in order to run vector graphics? Well, um, if you want to run uh, directly on the SVG, um, uh, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, so on the MCU side, we can go uh, uh, in a few hundred kilobytes. Uh, if you only like, you know, draw, let, let's draw one line and that's it. So, so the framework there is, is super small. And uh, then if we, uh, on, the, on the Qt5, we want to draw that and let's we you typically would use an embedded device, we can go roughly down to about 10 megabytes of RAM. Um, but, but then, you know, uh, it's usually more than just, you know, what's the absolute minimum because then you want to maybe utilize some hardware adapter, graphics acceleration and uh, or do some software acceleration and, uh, and and really want to have like a good uh, uh, frames per second and others so so those are impacting and then how many different elements you want to draw in the screen so that of course then also is impacting that but uh, we can go quite low in the uh, in that and that that 10 megabytes what i was saying is the full stack including linux and everything so that's like really hardcore uh, optimization but uh, and that's something we can do as a as a service. Excellent. There is, yeah, maybe maybe a few words on that one. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, there is a feature called or, or or concept. It's actually not a feature. It's a concept called Qt Light. I've been blogging about it every now and then uh, on the main Qt, and that means that there is a mechanism to cut down uh, and and uh, select which parts of the Qt are included in this build and into this image. So so. There is that mechanism, but but using that needs usually means you need to really understand the dependencies and how do different works uh, things work. So, thanks, Santu. And the second question I see on the list is, what about the application security? I, I that's a broad topic, so I don't know if you need clarification or if you can. Uh, yeah, comment. maybe maybe you know the security is you know in my mind security is a, is a mindset and architecture and uh, the way you do things. Uh, uh, security could be, you know, split into the hardware security and all the way to the securities and secure uh, sections of the hardware. So, so we do have customers doing that. But Qt is used in a, in a, in a different solutions uh, that could be um, tra treating with payments or uh, privacy. Qt is used with uh, solutions that are, depend, you know, uh, life supporting systems or or other in different medical conditions in different vehicles that move or spin or 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 are threat to your health and safety so the, you can uh, you really need to slice and dice that uh, security into into smaller details to be able to answer that but i think you know at a, at a broad sense uh, i'm not aware that we would have any security flaws or security items missing great and next we have a comment about the transition from 5.x to 5.15. Can you comment on on the upgrade process and the level of effort there at a high, you know, at a high level? Well, uh, the five series is binary compliant to each other. So, and and that of course applies if you have not many made any as as uh, as you go along with your project. If you do changes to the queue, you can obviously very easily uh, break the binary binary compliance for yourself. So, and that it has usually been the, the major uh, reason why customers may have difficulties in moving from one five release to another is that they've taken an older version of the Qt5 and as they go along with the project, they see that, okay, something is maybe not working on the Qt, so they, they take the easy way out. Let's just fix it there. And then they take the later version of the Qt and that fix that they made for themselves that they needed for their solution is actually not there on the later version. So obviously then you lose the binary compliance. Um, and there are a couple of ways to address, address that. So there are ways to, uh, you know, contribute that back to make sure that it's going to be there on the upstreaming in the, in the future releases. If you don't want to do it, um, then you have to take care of uh, managing that architecture really carefully so that you don't cause uh, run into that kind of situation yourself or or we can help in doing that uh, as a service. So we do have private branches uh, uh, when required, but usually those are quite big systems. 
um, that take that up. But uh, but just if you take the the vanilla Q5 uh, and you compile 515 application, uh, 558 application on 515, it should run. Great. And um, in Santu, the next question is about plans to add Adobe to Qt design tools. I know we have support with a plugin and we call it the Qt Bridge for Adobe Photoshop. And I am fairly certain Illustrator is next coming in a, in a future release. Do you happen to know what release that is? Nope, and uh, it's not my other. I can look it up uh, and more. In, uh, I think we can also look it up. Uh, so let's leave that maybe, you know, yeah. during the during the other presentations, you know, we can find it on the roadmap and then answer it at, at the end. Sounds great. And um, is C++ the only language we support? Could they use C Sharp? I have nope. not heard. C Sharp is not supported, but you can use C++, uh, Python, QML, JavaScript, HTML5, and did I miss something? So, so there is a number of different languages. So Qt is just much more than just C++, even though we do talk a lot about the C++ as, as a, and I'm the, the embedded guy in our end. So uh, in the embedded, you want to really utilize every single bit uh, on your hardware. So that's when you want to have like a really condensed binary. So that's usually when you look into the C++. But Great. C Sharp, no. Okay, we have probably time for two more and then we'll um, we'll do the others offline, but I'll, I'll present one one or two more. Yep. What, what is the Qt6 path for embedded devices without a GPU and is QML mandatory or will widgets still be available? QWidgets will be available. It's a good question. And this same question came up yesterday on a similar event with Italians, but yeah. Uh, so, so indeed, um, uh, QWidget UI is going to be supported on Qt6. It's just that QWidget UI is is the is the legacy UI, and it's it's really good when you want to write a native look and feel application. So something that will look like native Windows application on Windows and native Mac application on Mac. Uh, so it's 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 really good for that. When we talk about the embedded, there is no native. You, because they're usually it's a single solo, single application solution. So you invent the native for the embedded devices. And that's where the QML can really shine because it's a very efficient way of doing UIs for those solutions. So, so that's why I'm talking, I'm talking so much about the QML and we see that, that there's a lot of business on the embedded and a lot of future in the embedded. So that's of course, there is a lot of emphasis and talk about the, the QML as a UI, but QVG UI, definitely an important part and, and will be needed. And like our own tools are really using that because they want to have the native look and feel on the, on the native environment. So. Excellent. I think that's probably good for the moment, Santu. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I'd like to have Zach be able to have his presentation time and, and I can answer uh, as many of these as possible while we're doing the next presentation. So thank you. I'll mute myself in between. <laughs> Me too. Sorry about that. Um, I apparently I was I was on mute. I thought I uh, had had hit the button, but uh, yeah, we are we are uh, very happy for uh, Zachary Dahl to join us. He's joining us from uh, Chile, Bismarck, uh, North Dakota, uh, where I think. Spring has spring yet arrived? <laughs> I'm, anyway, um, you know, uh, Zach is actually uh, he's a lead engineer of displays for the Bobcat Company, uh, which is a global manufacturer of compact construction equipment. For the past eight years, he's focused on embedded devices and pushing the user experience forward uh, on the entire line of Bobcat Bobcat Company equipment, which includes skid steers, excavators, tele telehandlers, telescoping handlers. Um, and tool cats. If you don't know what a tool cat is, Google it. I'm telling you, you're gonna want one just for yard work. Those things do everything. Anyway, um, Zach has also served on the uh, QT advisory board and which provides real world direction in terms of where the QT product ought to go. And so we're grateful for uh, his time there. In his spare time, if he has any, uh, he's, he's an advocate for open source, or open source software. He loves to travel and he can frequently be found playing board games with uh, family and friends. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn the mic over to Zach and uh, Zach's gonna show you a little bit about 
some of the things that they've done at the Bobcat Company using Q. Thanks, Tim. Uh, all right. Um, so as Tim said, I work for Bobcat Company. Um, we recently used Qt uh, to really push the envelope when it comes to our uh, human machine interfaces on our displays on our new R series equipment. Um, you can see right here we have a T76 R series loader. Um, and so just talking about how we innovated our embedded software team, really, um, and our systems uh, with Qt. Um, I'm the lead engineer and I work at Bobcat. In Bismarck, uh, as Tim alluded to, it can get cold up here. Uh, it's in North Dakota, uh, which is 46th parallel, so still pretty far north. Um, this is the acceleration center. This is the, the building I work at. Um, and I'm actually in, you can't see me because it's a picture, but I'm actually sitting right in front of that, that first orange window right now. Um, so really, um, this is kind of, when I started working at Bobcat uh, almost eight years, no, almost nine years ago, um, this was the products that we had just launched um, for our machines. And these are basically like gauge clusters, basically. You can see on the, le or on the right that we have our uh, small uh, display that's pretty much in every piece of Bobcat equipment. Um, it's got a few gauges, a couple indicator lights, and some push buttons. And then of course it has a segmented liquid crystal display. Um, and then I was part of the uh, initial writing of the software for the deluxe display panel on the left. Um, this was a, a product that we used, um, uh, you know, just to offer a more deluxe experience, something with a full color LCD. And it had, you know, some support for integrated attachments and better troubleshooting and definitely a better user experience than the panel on the right, but still not very good um, by of course, by today's standards. Uh, so that's just to give us a reference about um, what we were actually challenged with for the next generation, the R series that just launched. Um, so the number one thing was does, we wanted a modern interface. Um, the pr previous generation was all about making sure things were available uh, and they were Bobcat tough um, and they were reliable. And if you look back at the history about when those were designed, you know, the iPhone wasn't even released yet. So the, um, the user experience expectation was much lower. Um, but now, as we've continually been in production on the M series, um, that expectation has, you know, rapidly changed. Uh, as Tim mentioned earlier, now when you get in, into a new car, you expect to have a nice user interface. That, that is an expectation. It's almost a requirement for many, many of our users. Um, so we wanted to make sure to design a modern interface. Uh, we also wanted to incorporate a wide range of new technologies, uh, news in parentheses, because it's, it's new to Bobcat, right? It's new to co compact construction equipment, but it's not really new to our consumers, right? That's why we needed the modern interface to interface with these new technologies. Um, and then of course, to make this thing uh, profitable, we needed to be able to be able to uh, reuse the code if possible on multiple platforms. Uh, we support, um, on the R series right now, we support our loader and excavator platforms, and we're planning to expand to future platforms, of course. Um, and when I say platforms, I'm talking about uh, Bobcat products, Bobcat product platforms. Um, and so we need to be able to customize this in a, an efficient manner. Um, so that was a challenge. And then we also, uh, since we operate construction equipment, we do have real-time processing deadlines. We have strict, you know, safety uh, requirements, um, and we needed to make sure that our system could meet those requirements. So uh, to help design a, our modern interface, we really, we uh, started out and we found a couple co uh, local companies, uh, sorry, North Dakota companies that were really leading UX designers and um, open a dialogue and actually talk about, uh, you know, the Bobcat style. Um, and how we needed to, we need the interface to be reliable. We need it to be, you know, tough, uh, Bobcat tough. And we needed to um, really uh, advance our interface, right? And so the idea was that we we're gonna extend our known interfaces. So how our operators currently operate the equipment um, and how they currently operate other devices, you know, consumer devices, tablets, 
uh, cell phones, stuff like that, to help smooth our user onboarding experience. Um, a lot of our machine interfaces involve calibrating our equipment and um, changing how the system responds to user input. And on the previous generation display, that was very unintuitive. Uh, it always required uh, opening up the user manual, reading a bunch of pages, putting in the right sequence of button presses, uh, because we didn't really have the, the flexibility that Qt, allowed, uh, Qt does allow us to have on the next R series. And then we really wanted to emphasize movement and animations as feedback. Um, so when a user pushes a button, they should see that the button is pressed um, because it does not have the haptic display of a physical button. Uh, so we really wanted to emphasize movement and animations and uh, the cute animation framework really helped us with that. Uh, and then as I alluded to, we had, we wanted to incorporate new technologies and none of these should be new to uh, our consumers but they are new to compact construction equipment and specifically Bogcat R series. So we integrated Bluetooth capabilities along with an integrated radio, uh, Wi-Fi for transmitting large quantities of data and uh, USB. So both for playing um, audio devices, sorry, playing me media files and also data transfer um, to store videos, um, even program the equipment, stuff like that. And then the two big things, um, from my perspective was we added a touch screen um, and a safety oriented real time video, also known as a, a backup video. So when you're backing up, uh, you have a camera feed. And so what Qt really provided us uh, in terms of this is it, it allowed us to create a uh, universal interface uh, when we were talking about these things and actually um, maintain the uh, maintain the interface across the different versions of the software. So we have a version of this software that runs on our, uh, you know, our machines on an embedded device. We have a version of the software that runs on the desktop environment that's used for our troubleshooters. Uh, so this is one of the first times that we are able to have a, the complete actual application that's running on our embedded devices also running in the Windows or Linux environment for our troubleshooters. And so we can interact with it and see exactly what our customers are seeing. Um, and then the, one of the other parts of the challenge was to have platform customization. Um, we really wanted to maintain a common code base across the products where possible. Um, a lot of our equipment uh, by its nature and by design operates very similarly. You know, you operate uh, a feature on the loader, it should maintain the same human machine interface as on an excavator. Um, and Qt allows us to do this. Uh, we dynamically load platform specific code at runtime and we use Q, Qt file selectors um, extensively for our QML front end. So um, for this product that we were talking about, we actually run, deploy the exact same application on every single one of our products. And at runtime, it configures itself to be an excavator, to be a loader, to be a compact track loader, et cetera. Qt really helped us with this one. And then as far as real-time processing deadlines go, um, working in, in an embedded world, we interface with the CAN bus. And so it's a large amount of data uh, that we need to process. And we have strict sta safety standards on how we interact with that. And you know, being able to command machine movement, it's very important uh, that we maintain our standards of safety. And so we ended up writing a Q custom Qt serial bus plugin to help manage and filter that data down to a, a manageable amount. And then we are also able to monitor and adjust our CPU load dynamically. Uh, and again, that is the same code that we can run on the desktop environment, um, as well as on our embedded device. It's really kind of amazing when you think about it. So in summary, um, what we ended up doing was we decided quickly that we wanted to use Qt Quick. So we used Qt Quick 2. Uh, we were able to do our initial prototypes on an Android tablet. So we're actually, you know, running, a, I think it was a Nexus 7. Uh, that's because that's pretty close uh, to the aspect ratio that we ended up going with. Uh, and we were able to also iterate on our virtual device as well as on the embedded software very quickly. So when we encountered a problem, we didn't have to actually pull up the hardware and have that available. And then we ended up proxying our CAN interface to help filter our messages. So this is a picture of the touch display project um, actually in use on the R series loader. Um, and with that, uh, I don't know if there's any questions or answers, but uh, that's what I had.
Maureen, any uh, any questions? Yeah, I'm just looking at the end here. I think there might be. Oh, how difficult was it to integrate backup cameras uh, in your Qt design? Any tips? Uh, yeah. So what we ended up doing was we were using uh, GStreamer um, in an external Qt process. And I would say that from a hardware perspective, it was very challenging, but from a software perspective, it was not. Uh, we used the power of Q threads um, to completely containerize GStreamer into a separate process. And we were able to communicate asynchronously whenever we would get GStreamer events. Uh, we'd be able to pass those out to the Qt application and vice versa. Uh, so we were able to use a hardware accelerated compositor in GStreamer. Um, and so from the Qt application perspective, we actually rendered a, you know, a blank uh, transparent section of the application. And then we were running the GStreamer uh, on a separate frame buffer that operates behind the Qt application itself. Excellent, thanks uh, Zach. And then there's a lot of us to do overlays, sorry. Oh, no, no worries, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, there's one more for you, Zach. How does your automatic configura configuring to different products work? Um, I'm trying to think about what I can say about this. Basically, um, when our software boots up, it looks at configuration files. Yeah, I can say that. It looks at some type of configuration files and it says, okay, I am a loader. Okay. And then for a loader, this, this is the version of software reload. Um, and by the way, let's set some cute file selectors. Um, so we used custom cute file selectors. Uh, and then in the QML on the HMI front end, you know, you're calling a specific file name, but using the, by installing the file selector, it'll actually automatically prepend. Um, I think it uses the plus symbol. So, it'll actually look into another folder based on the file selector. Uh, so we're able to have a single, the QML is effectively platform agnostic, and then it'll just look into a specific folder based on the Qt file selector that's installed. Excellent. Okay, so that's it. Th those are the only questions I'm seeing for Zach. Thank you, Zach. You know what, um, yeah, thank you. Can I, can I go ahead and ask a question on behalf of some of my clients? Um, I'm wondering, Zach, because, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, you know, the way that you um, can load different, different equipment. Do you by chance do uh, shrinking or enlarging of screen sizes as part of that as well or not? Uh, no, actually we don't. We, the HMI, uh, the visual, the visual aspect of the product is fixed. Um, that is the next challenge for the next version. <laughs> um, I know that um, screen sizes is, is becoming more and more, um, you know, the size, the physical size of the screen is becoming more of a, a market demand. And right. so I definitely think in the future, uh, that's going to be a challenge that we will have to solve. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and the, that's, that's why I asked the question. A lot of, a lot of people working with that same challenge. Yeah, definitely. And, um, we were able to, we, we don't actually deploy vector graphics, uh, but our entire interface is designed in a, you know, in a vector format. So in the future, we'd be able to effectively re rebake the assets and get us to a bigger size, but um, no, we didn't have to do anything like that. Okay. So, so um, we, at the at the uh, bottom of the hour, in about five minutes, we we're going to open it up to just general Q and A uh, session. Santu is is you know we're going to reengage Santu and in, involve him again. Uh, Maureen, myself, any questions about QT that you might have, you know, we're we're happy to address. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, one of the things that that I would like to do. Would be to um, uh, would be to uh, kind of switch things up, maybe wake some people up, and uh, play play a little game. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully, if you can see your screen, uh, we've got a game called "What's Behind the Mask." Is is it uh, is it showing? Are you able to see it? Am I sharing my screen? I guess that's the question. 
No, I don't see it. Okay. Um, well. And does this require interaction from the audience? <laughs> No, uh, so so here's uh, first of all we gotta we gotta get the uh, the screen sharing working first. Um, yeah, it 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 says it says that I'm sharing. So tell me uh, when you can see. Um, yeah, now we can see it. Okay, all right. We can good see the, yeah, good. Uh, okay, so. So, so here's the way the game the game works. Uh, as as you might know, the coronavirus has has really kind of introduced the wearing of masks into the mainstream. You know, it's kind of everywhere you go. You go to the grocery store, there's people wearing masks. You go to the post office. Look, look at Zach. If if you if you still have Zach on your on your computer, it's it's literally everywhere. So. So uh, people have become uh, attuned to to um, kind of recognizing facial expression and trying to read tone when listening to talking to people who who actually have a mask on. So, <laughs> sorry, uh, San San Two is taking it up a level. So, um, uh, but. Uh, but so yeah, so so we thought that uh, that we would play this game called "What's Behind the Mask." Um, you can you can enter your answers in the Q and A uh, section, or you can just answer them yourself. Uh, and and let's see how you do. Let's see how um, how accustomed to reading people who are wearing masks that that you've become. So if you remove the mask uh what kind of expression does taylor swift have what would you see a a smile b a frown or c she would be straight faced answers she's straight faced all right let's uh move on to the next one so is this pop star um actress is 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 this a pop star or an actress uh who is behind the mask is it a katie perry or is it b zooey de chanel go ahead and, and answer here's here's the it is zooey de chanel all right i always thought those two looked uh looked very much alike so anyway um Let's see who knows their emoticons here. Uh, what is the emotion behind the mask of this particular emoticon? Uh, kind of hard to tell just by the eyes. Is it A, sad, B, indifferent, or C, happy? Go ahead and answer. And the answer is happy. Those of you who got that right, congratulations. All righty, uh, from the world of sports, if you remove this mask, where will you find Stephen Curry's mouth guard? A, on the side of his mouth, B, on his teeth, or C, he has no mouth guard? Steph Curry, Golden State Warriors, for those uh, in California who are joining us, you better get this one right. It's A, the side of his mouth. That's pretty much where he always keeps that thing, chewing on it and gnawing on it whenever he's not uh, actively playing. All right, here we go. Uh, I think this is the last one. If you remove the mask, what will you find on the rock's face? A, he's wearing a beard. B, he's clean shaven. Or C, he's got a goatee. If you think about it, we've seen uh, The Rock with all three of those, all three of those looks, beard, clean shaven, or goatee. The answer on this particular day is, he's got a goatee. All right, uh, tally up your score. Let's see how, oh, sorry, we got one more. This is it, uh, last one, Ed Sheeran. Uh, what is Ed Sheeran wearing behind? Uh, there's something unusual about Ed Sheeran that he's wearing behind this mask. Is it A, lipstick, B, a clown nose, or C, a lollipop that's sticking out of his mouth? Answers, he's got a clown nose. All right, good enough. Um, that's, uh, that's all we have for this particular little game. Uh, we are going to open up the floor now. So if you have questions, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's take the next few minutes and uh, answer as many as we can. With that, I will turn it back over to our question moderator, Maureen.
Yeah, I, I, there's a question I like. You know, somebody's asking that. Um, what about cute for an uh, artificial intelligence app, uh, a virtual assistant, for example? And I, I, I'm just you know typing an answer to this, but I might as well answer it uh, in speaking. So there are actually several very well known artificial intelligence and virtual assistant out there uh, where the UI and the user interface is, is written with Qt. Uh, obviously, you know, most of our customers are not public references, so we cannot drop names there. Uh, also, in several industries, it's already, uh, I'd say, routine and a normal practice that uh, the, this kind of uh, artificial intelligence uh, virtual assistants are integrated to the rest of the solution and i think you know automotive industry is a very good example of that that there is all kinds of uh backend uh cloud services that are being uh, already already integrated into the ui so Qt works very well with those i think the it's all about the connectivity and handling of of these different data streams and that's where we have a uh, quite a lot of good apis and solutions already out there Thank you, Santu. I see a couple of others that we could attend to here. Uh, when will, I, I'm not sure, Santu, if you're prepared to answer this, when will Python be supported for embedded without the Riverbank licensing? Well, we, we, we've been looking into that and playing with that idea. We've done a couple of prototypes. Uh, I think the, the question there is that, what do you want to do with that? Um, so we know that it can be done. Uh, there is no special magic in there. Uh, it's just that we'd really like to hear uh, the the use cases and business cases in there so that we, we are focusing on the right thing. So that is definitely an area where we are looking into, uh, but we don't have a definite roadmap for that, that currently. I think the, the focus of our engineering is really to get the 6.0 out for the upcoming few months. Great. But and we really would like to hear your use cases. Hmm, that's true. That's a great suggestion. Looking for, there's some that I already have in progress. So, uh, are you using embedded OS with QT? If yes, then what kind of certification requirements for automotive products are, are, are necessary? I think that, that that came through uh, during the Zach your your presentation. So Zach, do, do you want to open that part up, uh, and then I can talk about generally in the in the security bits. Thank you. Uh, I can confirm that we are using an operating system, but I'm not allowed to say what operating system we're using. So, sorry. Okay, that solves that that part. So so um, we do support a, a number of different operating systems and. Um, and for the uh, certification and security certification on automotive is typically the customer picks uh, something that they can end to end certify. And we do have a solution uh, really tailored for the needs of the automotive business uh, or allowing secure presentation of the telltale. So the ABS light and the motor light and that kind of things that you need to certify for, for safety um, in, in that, that environment. And now a couple of medical customers are also looking into that, but that's a separate software component because Qt itself is quite a quite a huge piece. So there's no way of uh, certifying the whole Qt. So that, that's a dedicated specific software piece that is certified with uh, TÜV and it's a safe certification qualified for automotive and medical and a few other industries. And um, and then, of course, underneath that, you'll need a safe uh, operating system and a safe hardware and because the whole stack needs to be certified. So we, we do have a solution, uh, but there are specific solutions, specific use cases. Great. Uh, the next one, Santu, I think you might be able to answer this. Is commercial support for Qt device creation and boot to Qt available for their site SOM modules? I see a dozen Toradex modules in my license, but no Verisite SOM module. Uh, I can't remember if Verisite delivered those. Uh, they may be, um, I need to check. Uh, and I, you know, doing that, you know, is no, 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 no higher science. It's, it's, it requires you to understand how to play with the Yocto recipes, which are notoriously badly documented because no single company or person owns the Yocto layers. It's a combination of anybody playing there. Um, 
but I can't remember from the top of my head. I, I, I do have a feeling that we do have parasite boards also in there. I think we okay. can try to check. Great, we have a couple of others. Um, have you considered changing open source license to Apache 2.0? Any competent Silicon Valley IP attorney will tell you to run screaming away from GPL, it's toxic. Having an OSS license lets us try before buy and increases our interest in the paid license product. Uh, I think this licensing is something that, uh, because the way Qt is founded and uh, the way Qt is built since, since you know, uh, from the dawn of the, the century, and before the um, there are uh, the founding rules and agreements on how Qt runs. So, so those rules also guarantee that even if the Qt company would cease to exist, the Qt will stay alive and stay there. So that, of course, then also means that that kind of decision is not totally in our hands. So it's a it's mm -hmm. also like a community discussion, uh, which makes that kind of changes very hard. That's right. But we do have the dual licenses, so if you are not happy with the GPL and LGPL, buy the license. Then you're pretty much free to do anything. And the last one that I'm looking at, because I'm, I'm working on the others, is does anyone know, is Land Rover's sleek UI made with QT? I don't think we can comment something which is not, uh, not public. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, here's here's what I can tell you. Um, Land Rover would fall into this category, but uh, 18 or 19 of the top 20 automotive brands do use QT. So there's a good chance. There you have it. Uh, we have one more coming in. Oh. Uh, general question, are there any plans to add Figma in addition to Sketch and Photoshop support for QT eventually? That, I don't know. I think we would need to ask um, the, the guys working on the design tools that, yes. so that's something we need to park and come back. Yes, that was one I was going to research in the back end. Thank you, Philippe, for, answer, for asking that. What was the thing I need? To, I need to look into the very sign. Just a second. That's right. Yeah, I have a note of that. Okay, great. I think that covers it because again, I'm, I'm answering, I'm in the process of answering some of these already in the background. Okay. Uh, so I, I think we're done with Q&A right now, unless anyone has any questions they'd like to add on, we can always add those to our list and, and respond afterwards as well. Yeah, uh, quickly looking into Verisite is offering Qt already on their site, uh, offering how, how it can be. And I, I do have a feeling that we have that up. Excellent. So Tim, should I share the last piece here? Sure, go ahead, Maureen. That'd be great. Great. So yep. what, what? Yep. Oh, thank you, Santi. Yep. In real time. Yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. That's great. So the last, the last bit we wanted to share is, is essentially a resource page that uh, Christine and Iris, our marketing folks that have organized this event, have put this together. And it's really tailored for this event and focusing a lot on the topics that have been covered, specifically embedded uh, device you know, uh, development. But we've also included things that I think are, are pretty interesting and Santu had mentioned them in his presentation, uh, such things as the latest release of Qt 515, long-term supported release, so you can quickly and easily find these at this page. Also, the new version of Qt Creator 4.12.2 and also Qt Design Studio 1.5. So these are readily available at this, uh, this particular URL, and I'm going to copy this into the chat window. And I encourage you all to, to look in here. One of the things I did want to point out was the virtual tech conference recordings. Those are, and many of you on the phone and, and on this webinar today have probably uh, been to some of those uh, virtual tech conference videos. But, but if you haven't, I highly encourage you to, to go to that page and look through the topics because they were very um, well received and there was a Q&A associated with each of those. So it's so a lot of 
really interesting and useful information anytime you see this heading virtual tech conference. And uh, yeah, if there's other things, if you have suggestions on things you'd like to have added to this page, you know, feel free to send those in the Q and A as well. We'll add uh, we'll add some new links, so it'll be easier for you to find. Um, but I'll, and there's lots of great videos too. So please um, please take advantage of this, and we'll continue to uh, refine it to help those of you on the phone to to uh, target the information that's. Uh, very interesting, I hope. And just, just to piggyback on some of uh, Mo's comments, I, the, the virtual tech con was, was a huge worldwide event. Essentially, it was two days of, of really free training on how to develop more effectively and efficiently using Q. Um, and, and so, like, like she said, all of those sessions were recorded, um, and those are wonderful resources for you to uh, go ahead and take advantage of. Um, I'd like to open it up even, even further and let you know that we do have uh, online training classes uh, from the QT company as well as a, an entire wing of the QT company that is, uh, that is uh, devoted to consulting services. So if you need help, uh, you know, putting together your, uh, your cute design, that's something that uh, we can certainly assist you with. Uh, if you need training uh, because you're new to Qt, you know, by all means, um, regardless, I guess, of, of what your stage is with the project, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach out to us at qt.io and um, just let us know that, uh, that you uh, attended the uh, Meet Qt for Embedded uh, Devices and, um, and uh, you know, let us know how, how we can help. We want to be a resource for you. So um, I guess with that, uh, unless anybody else on the panel has any further comments, uh, we're going to go ahead and say good afternoon, good night, or you know wherever you find yourself. Thanks, Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for joining. Good night, again.